continue. So, after these uh, sections, we came to section 7 on the linear vector equation. We did not spend uh, much time on the waving equation, but instead mu really much time on the linear affection equation. So that you should know, of course, and also where to give the boundary conditions. We have an example in the trial exam on that. So that is an example, those, both of them are examples as we as I said earlier, of hyperbolic equations where we have characteristics. The scheme that you should know very well is the forward time centered space scheme. There, we'll have that in the trial exam. We can show that it is consistent, but that, that it is not stable. And that means it is not convergent. So that means this scheme is useless. Instead, we can use the explicit upward method. <coughs> While for, for, the, for the forward time centered space, we just do the um, <coughs> we have the stencil, the new value at the old time level is dependent on the old one, and we use both neighbors. So we those do not take into account in which way the flow is uh, going. But for the upwind method, we determine the value at the old time level dependent on the advection velocity. If that is positive, then we take the upwind value. So that is for c greater zero. We go in the direction from where the flow is coming. That makes sense. And then we can get a stable scheme. So that scheme that we have here then is uh, stable. Um, if we have this equation that c is larger than zero, then the current number is larger than zero, and that has to be uh, lower equal than one. And that where the capital C is the current number. That is the advection velocity that we have in the equation. Just to give you the reminder, u t plus c u x equals zero. That is the linear advection equation. And it is this c, the advection velocity, that is here then in the numerator. And c delta t, that is the distance that our unknown travels in one time step delta t. That ratio to the grid spacing is the current. And we can illustrate that by the characteristics if we have the xt diagram. If we have the xj, the grid point, xj, the grid point, xj minus 1. So we have here the time level n, and we have here the time level n plus 1. We want to determine the value there. The exact solution could be determined by taking the characteristics down to the old time level. So the, uh, this <coughs> characteristics, it has its uh, curve x of t, which has a slope that is simply the c, as we have the advection velocity. And if c is positive, then it has this, looks like that. And the condition is that the foot point here, at this distance here, that is then the c delta t. That is the distance traveled within the time step delta t. That has to be smaller or equal than delta x, which is the grid spacing. That is the, the CFL condition, stability condition. And then we can, if we do that, then we can find out this point. We can interpolate this point by the value, the approximation of u 
at these grid points. It's just a linear interpolation. That is then the explicit output method. The nice thing with this scheme is it is exact for current number one. That is special speciality. So in this case, the scheme gets more and more accurate and even exact if you approach one. And if, if you choose one, current number one, it is exact. So that was the scheme that is useful. However, it is only first order in time and space, right? While this that is useless, but nevertheless it is first order in time and second order in space. But we cannot use it. But we can use it when we replace the explicit Euler method by a Ranakata method. For example, the third order or fourth order Ranakata method. Then it works fine. But that is then three times or four times the work of the explicit Euler. Third option, implicit or implicit upward method. So instead of using the explicit Euler in time, we would use then the implicit Euler in time. But still, same idea of doing the upward discretization. So in that case, we would determine the value at the new time level using its neighbor from where the flow is blowing. In this case, it is then from the left. So that would be for C, also for C greater than zero. That leads to a linear system. So, like we had also for the simple implicit method for the heat equation, a linear system. While this linear system was tridiagonal for the heat equation, this will be bidiagonal, only two diagonals. So we can solve it just by forward substitution. And this is first order in time and space, and it is unconditionally stable for all current numbers c greater than zero. And that means it is convergent, that is the conclusion, convergent for all current numbers greater than equal zero. So we can choose the time step as large as we want. But again, it doesn't set says convergent means that the numerical solution approximates the exact one as delta t and delta x go to zero. It does not mean that we get good result with the delta x and delta t that we choose. And we saw we could get for smooth problems, for weight transported, much better results if we use, for example, the Lex-Wendorf scheme, which is second order in time and space. But if we have discontinuous problems, the lux wendorf scheme will give us oscillations, while this upwind method does not. However, if we choose the current number not uh, close to 1, we will get quite smeared results. So that all what we have discussed so far were linear problems, but then we saw also the treatment of non-linear problems by looking at the Burgess equation. So that gives us more interesting features that model actually the shock that we have in gas dynamics and the rarefaction rate that we have in gas dynamics. We had uh, the examples for the Burgess equation, and that was an example of a conservation law. Where we have a conserved quantity, in our case for the Burgess equation it would be the velocity itself, and we have a flux function, f of u. We take the x derivative of that, and if we take a, a parabolic conservation law like the Burgess equation, then we would have a right-hand side where we have second derivatives. And for the Burgess equation, it would be the choice of the flux function, capital F of u, would be u squared half then we would have the Burgess equation. And the inverse Burgess equation, we will have with this choice and with nu equal to zero. That is a hyperbolic conservation. We can look at also here at the characteristics. And they are given by the curves x of t. 
which have them for the Burgess equation. Uh, let me take the general thing. They are equal to the characteristic velocity. So the characteristic velocity of a conservation law that is A of U is D F of U DU or F prime of U. So for the Burgess equation, it would be F prime of U squared half. It would be U itself. That would be the characteristic uh, velocity of the Burgess equation. And that, uh, determine, though, that determines then the slope of the characteristics. We had also looked at Riemann problems where we have discontinuous uh, uh, initial conditions which were constant on either side of the discontinuity where we could have either a shock or a rarefaction wave. We looked at Rankine and Pigonier condition. Um, just write it down. Rankine Pigonier condition. Take it up here because it is also part of the trial exam. The finite difference methods that we studied were in conservation form. And that means the following that we can write the scheme in the usual way for an explicit scheme, we use the usual approximation of the time derivative, the approximation of the new time level minus the one at the old time and divided by the time step delta t. And then we do the approximation in such a way that we <coughs> determine a numerical flux function, little f, of uh, the phase between grid point j and j plus 1 minus f of j minus 1 half divided by delta x. And that is then zero for the case where nu is zero. So, and these f, f j plus minus one half, those are the numerical flux functions. At the grid point, not the grid point, the faces, x j, plus minus one half. They are the midpoints between grid points xj and j plus one and xj and j minus one. And there we look at a couple of them. And the one that we studied really in much detail was the explicit coupling method. the catch there is to determine the characteristic velocity at the face in a clever way. It is actually in such a way that we have the, the ranking the new condition fulfilled there. And that gives us then the way to determine from which way the flow is, from where the flow is blowing. Upwind or from the left or from the right, we find out through the characteristic speed that we determine them in a clever way. The stability condition is then a generalization of what we have derived for the linear vection equation. It is the, actually the maximum number of the current number. It has to be smaller equal than one because here the velocity if we have the Burgess equation enters itself. So the, the C that we had in, in the um, the infection equation is now the u, and the u is changing. So we have to choose the maximum 
modulus there to get the condition. Other examples that are useful to know are the flex predix method. We can write all these uh, examples that we had in, in a certain way. Also, another one that is more useful <coughs> is the local expertise method. Because the Lex Critics is very diffusive when the time step goes to zero. So, as an example for this one, it would be fj plus one half, would be one half, and then we have an average where we take the flux function of the conservation law, so this then from this f at the grid point j, and at the grid point j plus 1. If we would stop here, we would have a central discretization. But we don't stop here, we take here the, um, the in that case, the modulus of an approximation of the characteristic uh, velocity, it's A there, times the difference in uj plus 1 and uj. So that is typical. And for the Lex Friedrichs, this happens to be the A that we have there. So let's see. A, j plus 1 half for the Lex Friedrichs is the maximum of the characteristic speed that we have with the grid point f prime of uj. So that is the, the characteristic speed in the grid point xj. We take the absolute value of that. And we look at the characteristic speed f prime at the neighbor. Also the absolute value, and we take the maximum. For this here, this example, it is uh, not the A, it is simply the delta T. So here we would write that as an example, J plus one half for the X radics is simply the delta X over delta T. So there you see the problem when we have this delta T going to zero, this gets very large. And if we divide by delta x, multiply by delta x, we see that the characteristic speed modulus aj plus one half times delta x delta, delta x over two is functioning as a numerical viscosity. So, and when that delta t gets large, this numerical viscosity gets very large. And in the explicit Euler method, this a is determined essentially by the Rankine of a new condition. So then we have uh, an overview of the methods that we can use for the inviscid, for inviscid conservation laws. And if we have uh, the full parabolic conservation law, we have also to discretize this, but we do that as we did the heat equation, just for sec standard second order discretization of the second derivative. So that is usually not a problem. Usually the indicit terms that are more difficult here, they are actually non-linear. Uh, even for the linear case, for the linear vector equation, not so easy. So then, after having treated here then a non-linear problem, we focus on the hyperbolic part because that's the difficult one. We move on to the Poisson equation. Which is 2D, second derivative of u, the second derivative of x, second derivative of y, u, is equal to some given right hand side. And there we use the standard finite difference 
method. That is when you have a point ij, then the neighbors, the next neighbors, both in i and j are involved. That leads to a linear system, actually a block triadiagonal linear system. It can also be seen as a pentadiagonal linear system with five diagonals. So it's a sparse matrix that has to be solved. So that is then reduced to an algebraic problem. And it turns out that the matrix that we get from that, so we get a linear system, a block, a triadiagonal linear system, and the matrix is actually center diagonal, five diagonals, that this matrix is diagonally dominant. that the absolute value of the entry in the diagonal is larger than the sum of the moduli of uh, the neighbors in the same row, the matrix. That has to be hold for all, and for at least one diagonal it has to be larger than the sum of the moduli of the neighbors. That is quite straightforward. If we have Neumann, if we have directly boundary conditions for Neumann boundary conditions, it's a little bit more difficult. <coughs> we have also there an example in the trial exam. <coughs> so the key of that, of for, and that is an elliptic problem, which is determined by the boundary conditions. The key there is then the solution of this linear system. Therefore, we have then looked at. Chapter 10, the solution of linear systems. Of equations. So where we can say, we, in our case, we, we have to say A, in our case U, the unknowns at all the grid points is equal to some given right-hand side. And then we distinguish direct methods <coughs> direct methods, and there we look at the TDMA or the Thomas algorithm. <coughs> Other name is TDMA, try the Eigenal matrix algorithm, that is LU, decomposition, forward, backward, substitution for a tri diagonal linear system. So we have just the main diagonal, two diagonal neighbors above and below. That is our unknown U and some right hand side B. So we do the LU decomposition and then we solve forward back. So that is then, and that takes eight, if the, the dimension is NJ, then this takes eight, about eight times nj operations. Takes about eight nj, that is floating point operations, which we call flux, for uh, nj unknowns. So the u is a nj vector. And that can be generalized uh, also to other problems, but uh, if we are in 2D, we have the fill-in problem, so therefore <coughs> direct methods are not so efficient for two and especially three dimensions, and therefore mostly iterative methods are used for in 2D and 3D.
where we need in any case an initial guess. Then we can compute the solution at the new time level just by a simple operation. We have also an example in the trial exam. So, and here we do that um, without updating. So we compute the new iteration for all. And once we have done that, then we have the solution updated and continue. While in the Gauss Seidel, as soon as we have a new update, we've already used it. So the Gauss, the Gauss Seidel is uh, about a factor of two faster than the Jacobi method. But if we would do that on a parallel computer, then it would be advantageous to use Jacobi. We can also use other methods, but that is not uh, that important here. We had also others, the SOR, that were was even much faster than the Gauss Seidel. And the next chapter, 11, that was in the week after Easter, to the convection diffusion equation. So there we generalized what we had seen in 1D, and for the nonlinear problem even in the Burgess situation, to 2D. And there we look at the forward time-centered space, which in that case actually is stable under the stability condition. And for the upwind convection and centered diffusion. So we have <coughs> two options. So we found then that the forward time-centered space scheme Stable. We have two conditions. If we summarize those two conditions, you will find them also in the solar algorithm. In addition, the solar algorithm also uses the CFL condition. One condition is the one that is coming from the condition that we would have for a parabolic problem, just for the 2D heat equation. It looks like this: one over delta x squared, one over delta y squared. So that is one condition. That is the condition you have for 2D heat equation. And the other condition is then coming where we have both the effect. This is the, in that case, the diffusion coefficient, alpha. And C1 and C2 are the velocities with which the transport takes place. So that are, those are describing the convection. And that is the modulus of uh, that square is the, the denominator. So this part is independent of the delta x and delta t. The method is first over in time, second over in space. And that is the method used in the solar algorithm for solving the uh, momentum equations. And as I said, we had also this other option the uh, advection upwind and the diffusion central. That was also another option. Let's see. Yeah, and then the final one, chapter, that is definitely not pensum, but it is showing you why we have been doing this. It is the introduction to the discretization of the 2D incompressible Navier-Stokes equations. So, and as I said, we have now been using the ingredients. What I just said a minute ago, we have been using the forward time center space for the convection diffusion equation applied to the momentum equations. Then we have been solving the Poisson equation for the pressure correction that we had discussed before as an example of the elliptic equations. So those, we, we put together our bricks to make the building of the Navier-Stokes 
And the method that we have been studying here is the marker and cell method. And uh, the catch with it was that it is using a staggered grid, where the pressure and the velocities are uh, placed at, uh, at uh, different locations, which gives a nice coupling between pressure and velocity. But as I said, this is not pensum, but it is showing you why we did this. So we have all the bits and pieces, and here we put them together to do what we wanted to do, to solve the 2D incompressible analysis equations. Okay, so that is my brief summary of uh, the, the course. But as I said in the beginning, I suggest that you go through your notes, look at the videos, and complete that. And uh, for example, here, if you're unsure about that, just go there and uh, write down what this is. That you should be able to do. You know, if you're asked, write down the forward time centered space for the 2D convection diffusion equation, you will be given the equation, you should be able to do that. We have trained it for the convection equation, this linear convection equation, we have trained it for the heat equation, to just put the bits and pieces together. And it is in 2D, where we use the same notation as we use for the Poisson equation. So, it's not difficult, but um, you have to go through it and do a little repetition. Okay, so that's all for me for today. For tomorrow, then, the idea is to go through a part of the trial exam. We will not be able to compute all, all um, parts of it. It's um, uh, quite a bit. So maybe it was, it's, it was got a little bit too loud, too long, so that you might get a little bit shorter for the real exam. But it's a good training for you. Okay, then we'll meet tomorrow. Thank you.